It's time to accelerate. Hey, friends, this is Andy. Welcome to episode 548 of Accelerate, the sales podcast of record, where I hold in depth conversations with today's leading experts in sales, marketing, and leadership six days a week. Joining me today on the show for the very first time is Randall Bell. Randall's the CEO of the Landmark Research Group, and he's also the author of an interesting book we're going to talk about today. It's called Me, We, Do Be The Four Cornerstones of Success. As you're here in our discussion, it's all about habits and the power of habits. And if you listen to the show a lot, you know I really believe that habits are what dictate our success in life and in work. And so we're going to talk about the four cornerstones of success that Randall lays out in his book, which are really foundational habits that you build around. They're the me habits, the we habits, the do habits, and the be habits. And it sounds like I'm talking about rabbits, but we're talking about habits. So if you'd like to see the show notes for this episode, if you hear something in the episode and just didn't catch it at the time, you're going to go back and reference it, go to andypaul.com forward slash 548. You'll find there a time step breakdown of this conversation as well as all conversations that we had on Accelerate. Check it out. Friends, you know, we all hit a sales slowdown from time to time. And you know, oftentimes we sort of default to the notion that the solution is more structure and more process. But sometimes you just got to try new ideas to break out of the doldrums and to sell up to your potential. So if you're looking for some new ideas about how to amp up and accelerate your sales, then you need to download and read the new report I've put together just for you. It's, it's based on the specific recommendations of the more than 300 experts I've personally interviewed on this program. And I've compiled their practical tactics and strategies into a step-by-step guide that you can use to accelerate your sales today. And it's free, so don't wait. Go to accelerate.fm forward slash accelerate to get your free copy of my report today. And finally, before I talk with Randall Bell, before we bring on the show, if you like this show, if you like Accelerate, really help us out if you subscribed, left us a review, because we really appreciate getting your feedback for what we can do to make this a more valuable investment of your time. All right, so let's jump into it. Randall Bell, welcome to Accelerate. It's great to be here, Andy. Thanks. Well, hey, my pleasure to have you on. So I always start my show with a standard question I ask all my guests, and that question is, in your opinion, what's what's the single biggest challenge facing sales reps or sales teams today? I think it's keeping it simple. I think having a direct message that is simple and well thought out and to the point that uh, is uh, void of any kind of jargon and, and tells people directly what how you can benefit them is missing with a lot of salespeople today. And the solution to that? I think it takes a long time and a lot of work to, to really come down to that simple messaging. You know, the, the thing I always ask people, uh, salespeople, is... Tell me exactly why I should buy your product over someone else's. And if, if you're not able to answer that question immediately and quickly and concisely, if you're looking at the person like a deer with the, your eyes in the headlights, you got a problem. You got to be on your toes, able to answer that question at any time. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I mean, it, that sh- should be one of the first questions you should learn how to answer. I mean, I, I have a story from back when I had started sales eons ago and i walked into this one company i was out physically cold calling as we did in those days selling computer systems and to businesses and you know i asked for the ceo walking the front door of the lobby i asked for the ceo i had no expectation that i was going to get to see the ceo but about 30 seconds later this sort of distinguished looking gray-haired silver-haired man comes out and introduces himself shakes his hand we go into his office and i was sort of sort of stunned and uh yeah, this huge desk, which in the fashion of the time, there was this was you know sort of before personal computers, so there was nothing on his desk. It was completely clear, and it was about the size of a small aircraft carrier. And he opens up his top right hand drawer on his desk and takes out this stack of business cards. I swear it was about three or four inches high. And he takes the rubber band off, and and he starts showing it to me. And these are all people just like me <laughs> that had been there. He goes, so um, all these people have come and asked me to buy something and I never did. So tell me, why should I buy from you when I didn't buy from any of these people? <laughs> and same thing. I had, I, I had no idea <laughs> why that should be the case at that particular point in time. And, 
about a year later, though, I did get the order from him. So I eventually learned how to answer that question. But yeah, yeah, if you can't answer that question, no one has time for you. Yeah, exactly. And you got to be quick because there's so much competition. There's so much noise. And if you can't drill down, you know, I was in Dallas uh, a couple weeks ago speaking at a big event. And, you know, I met a lot of people and I'd say, well, what do you do? And they would tell me these phrases that, and, and I'm a reasonably intelligent person. I'm not the brightest guy on the planet, but I do have four college degrees. And they would tell me what they did. And I frankly had no clue what they were talking about or, or they were so vague that it could have described their, what their answer could have described anyone on the planet. You know, I, I do, I deliver solutions. I mean, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, so I think, you know, not wasting people's time, saying what you do without trying to be overly cute about it. uh, Answering that question, why you should buy from me over someone else. Those are all essential uh, sales points that a lot of salespeople are just completely off base on. Well, it leads into the topic of the conversation today, which is really, we're going to talk about the book, the recent book you've written, and which in itself is really about behavior change and habits. So one habit, clearly, sales professionals should be adept at, is being able to succinctly tell somebody what they do. So just by way of introduction, you have published a book recently called The Me, We, Do, Be. I shouldn't, I always, I put those do be together because I have to, I have to, every time I <laughs> read the title out loud, I think of Frank Sinatra, do be, do be, do, and so on. But um, so me, four words, me, we, do be, four cornerstones of success, uh, written by Randall Bell, not Frank Sinatra. So, um, so tell us why you wrote this book. Well, I had this unique, I've had this unique career for 25, 35 years where I've gone off to 50 states, seven continents, and I've studied disasters. And and you name a Why are you studying disasters? As an economist, I would go out and study what, what was called diminution value. Translated into English, I would measure the damages. So, for example, when I worked on the world, I would be the person to say, well, that disaster costs X billion dollars or X, you know, $100 million. Uh, I worked on the hurricane This was, this was 9-11, you're saying? Yeah, 9-11. Uh, I worked on the BPO spill, Hurricane Katrina. I worked on the now, who O.J. Hired, Simpson. Who hired you in those cases? Uh, well, each case is different. The World Trade Center is hired by the Lower Development or Lower Manhattan Redevelopment Corporation. They own the land that right. the tower sat on. Right. Uh, BPO spill. I was hired by uh, hundreds of homeowners and property owners. Every case is different. Got it. But I would measure the economic impacts of these disasters. The oil. I do work for oil companies, corporations, government. I'm doing work for the federal government right now. Um, but. This gave me unique access to the people behind the statistics, and I thought this is too valuable of an experience to just, at the end of my career, go play golf. Besides, I'm a lousy golfer. So uh, years ago, as I'm flying around to Chernobyl and Hiroshima and all these various disasters, on the flights, I would r- be working on this book. The book twenty took 25 years to write, but it's basically a formula to avoid disaster and, more importantly, build success. And it's a very simple formula, but it's remarkably powerful. Using the same formula, I've gotten, I've generated billions and billions of dollars for my clients. So it, it's not a theory. It's not sugar-coated nonsense. It really works. Okay. Well, I mean, you have a, a great saying near the beginning of the book, which I, I like. I think people should, should take the heart because I, I love books about habits and behavior change and, and you know, huge believer as you are that that uh, the only thing you can control is yourself <laughs> in this world and the thing you had in the book that i liked was you know, today's habits are tomorrow's destiny and i think that's that's hugely powerful for people listening to the show thinking about perhaps the habits they have that that they would like to change um that really says it all Yeah, it really does, because, you know, the biggest mountain in the world is made out of tiny grains of sand, which I liken to daily habit. They add up. The ocean is filled with tiny drops of water. So your daily habits add up. And anybody who gets wealthy knows that they do it a dollar at a time. You read a book a page at a time. So if a lot of these complex disasters or or complex problems, people think that the answer has to be big and complex. It doesn't. It actually is the reverse. It, It comes down to being very, very simple very straightforward, a step at a time. That's what creates authentic growth for sales or for leadership or for anything, quite honestly. 
Okay, well, you've got the book divided into four cornerstones, and we're going to briefly go through those. So, many for people who have read Charles Duhigg's book about power of habit, when you're talking about the cornerstones, you're really talking about, I think, what he calls keystone habits. And why don't you explain what, what those are? Yeah, I've read his book, and it's a good one. But my book takes a different angle, though, uh, because I'm talking about the four cornerstones of life, what those are. And you can take any life, any business, and divide them into these four cornerstones. Uh, the first one is me. Me is our mindset. It's it's everything we believe, think, and feel. So that everything going on in our in our minds is is really the essence of me. We is connections, uh, relationships, um, how we relate to other people, how we attract a good team, how we get rid of toxic people, all the things surrounding uh, we and connections and relationships. Do is productivity. Uh, in economics 101, you learn about land, labor, and capital. But in do, in the book, we're talking about physical fitness. We're talking about financial fitness. We're talking about having a, a good, solid environment uh, with our home space, our workspace, um, that kind of thing. And then the final cornerstone, B, is what we're becoming. It's our legacy. It's uh, it's really our, our 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 future. What we're what future we're creating. So it's managing our time, setting goals, and creating a legacy. Okay. Yeah, I want to come back to the the legacy thing, but so I'll go through these these cornerstones in order. So as you said, me is is habits to improve the quality of our thinking. Is how you phrase it in the book. So what what do you mean by that? Well, you, 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 everything that we think, believe, and feel makes up our me. So thinking is intellectual. What, in other words, if you're a salesperson or a leader, uh, you should be reading, reading, reading on your topic. You know, the trade magazines, all of that. You should, you know, have an absolute command of everything going on in your industry and business. Uh, philosophical is everything you believe. It's, it's your mission statement. It's, it's um, your business philosophies. And then feeling... Uh, you can use the term spiritual or whatever you want, but it's kind of the vibe. It's kind of your sense of business. You know, you always hear the term, that guy's got a really good feel for the business. And that's what it is. It's it's everything you feel, believe, and think that com- that adds up to your, your me cornerstone. And it's really essential because your thinking really drives you, drives you in direction, the direction you're going to go. So you got to, you know, first pay attention to the me cornerstone, everything going on in my head. Yeah, I, there's a famous quote, I forget who said it, is, you know, it's not enough to think, you have to think of something. And, and I think that really ties what you're talking about from the intellectual, philosophical, is, yeah, sort of along that statement, you know, the unexamined life's not worth living, is, is you, have to, you have to spend some time thinking about these things. You know, you have to have a, a point of view, you have to stand for something. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right, Andy. And one of the points I make in the book, and I actually hear a lot of feedback about this, is you know a lot of people wake up and they jump right into the day. They get immediately distracted with all the things going on. And what I recommend to CEOs, salespeople, leadership people, uh, someone on the management team, is before you do that, conscientiously t- carve out, whether it's 15 minutes or a half an hour. For myself, it's an hour. I get up before the entire family, and I think – and I read and I really develop my me cornerstone, the things that are really important to me without all the distractions. And that's, uh, you plan your day, you think about what's really important, your priorities, that that me cornerstone has got to be solid before you jump into all the distractions that pile up uh, throughout the day. That, you know, it's kind of a reflective time, if you will. Yeah, well, you talk about quiet time. And I I, I, th- I believe, if I remember correctly, is you know, you reference in the book is that you know, great quiet time is in the shower. I know it is for me. I mean, that's, <laughs> I'm yeah. famous for taking long showers because I get lost in thought. Yeah, in the shower, I, I, I joke with everyone and say all the great ideas come up in the shower. Why is that? It's because there's no iPhones, there's no cell phones, there's no TV, there's no radio. It's just you and your thoughts. And that's why, you know, quite honestly, uh, showers are, are the, pl- the place where the most amazing Ideas come to mankind uh, is while we were taking a shower because there's no conversations with other people. It, it's just quiet, reflective time, and we need to create more of that to have a solid meat cornerstone. Well, at the same token, I think more great ideas and thoughts are forgotten in the shower because people forget from the time they turn the water off to the time they get to their iPhone <laughs> or wherever it is to write it down. I know in my case, I yeah. always I try to develop a system to remember these great ideas that, that come. So some of the other me habits you you talk about that you know I think worth exploring is is so you did this 
the survey of you call your rich rich survey, I think it was. Uh, why don't you explain what you did and some of the data that we you picked up out of that from some of the me habits? Yeah, what we did is I have a research firm that I'm the CEO of, and we work on all these cases. So I use the infrastructure here to conduct an international survey. We surveyed 5,000 people in the United States, Canada, Australia, and the United Kingdom, uh, basically all the major English-speaking uh, areas around the world. And we basically asked a whole bunch of questions. Part, part of the questions were about, hey, how much money do you make? What's your uh, level of wealth? What's your level of education? How good is your romantic life? How happy are you? We asked all kinds of questions that were basically various measures of success. Um, and then we also asked a, a whole bunch of questions about daily habits. You know, how much do you read? Do you watch TV? Do you smoke? Do you exercise? Do you make your bed in the morning? Uh, do you brush your teeth? How often do you brush your teeth? And then statistically, we correlated all these various habits with various measures of success. And through this process, we're able to say very definitively what daily habits statistically correlate with success. So in the me corner zone that we're talking about, those who take some quiet reflective time or meditation, prayer, whatever you want to call it, uh, on a daily basis are 92% more likely to have an advanced college degree. And those who read books regularly are 122% more likely to become millionaires. And they also dominate in all the areas of success, whether it be romance or education and so on and so forth. So those are some of the big habits that, that kind of came out of the, the whole me cornerstone. Well, I think the, the one that was highlighted the most for me personally is most important is you know, the honesty and integrity. Habit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and all of it's self-assessment. You, you know, if you lie to you, if you go to the doctor and you're sick and you, you try and, uh, you know, lie to the doctor, lie to yourself, you're not going to get better. So, you know, integrity, I do ask some pretty direct questions about honesty, integrity, uh, where you really got to take some more quiet, reflective time and say, hey, how am I really doing on this? Uh, and be honest with yourself. And, you know, re really, where can I do better? Yeah, and I I was influenced on this by my dad growing up because I just remember as a very young kid uh, he would if we we're in the restaurant and there was an error on the bill in his favor, right? They, they undercharged him or you know they didn't put something on the the bill that we ate or something. He would correct him, right? He would even though it worked sort of to his advantage, but no, no, he just you know that wasn't right, and he always sort of made the point is, you know, at the end of the day, when you, you know, get to the end of your life, you know, if you have your integrity, then you really, you have a lot at that point, right? And uh, absolutely, so, Andy, yeah. I just, that was, to me, it was such a tremendous role model to, to have that and, you know, reflect in what, what I do as well. So, and then from the we habit, so that was sort of briefly, people are going to have to read the book if they want to get into more detail on these things, but Going to, to the we category, you talk about those are the habits that build relationships, that govern our connections with other, and and you talk about this idea of building social capital. Why don't you explain what that means? Well, social capital is so incre incredibly important. It's more important than financial capital. Social capital is basically your, your connections. Like just this morning, I had a staff meeting. A question came up with one of the research things we had in Texas, and I called up a buddy of, of mine that I've known for years in Texas. And what do you know? Uh, he sent over just piles of information that, that saved us hours and hours, probably weeks and weeks of work. Um, that's social capital. I've, I've taught seminars, given speeches all over the country. I, I have a network of people that, and by the way, I do the same for other people. It's a two-way street. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so just having this network of people, like I have another case in Florida that I'm, I'm going to Florida next week. I got a guy there who's ideal for the research I want to do there. I've worked on, with him on two other cases. And I know guys in Hawaii and all over the place. So that network of people is, is, it creates enormous benefits for my clients. It you know, results in benefits for them, for ourselves. Uh, and it's more valuable than, uh, you know, a new laptop or some new car or something like that. I, 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 I really respect the, the contacts that I have. Hopefully I do things in a way where they have the respect uh, back. And, and, and I'm able to do these cases around the very big, complex cases around the world because I have this network of social capital. And with that, then you also bring up sort of a subset of that you call your success circle, which I thought was an interesting concept. And 
spoken to other guests uh, in the last uh, six months or so that that have developed a similar concept. So why don't you tell people what you mean by a success circle and why you need one? Yeah, um, on my cell phone, I have you know you have your favorites, and in there are about twenty or thirty guys, men and women, uh, you know, that I know and have known for a long time. And I I sat down one day and I just thought, you know, I met a lot of people. You've met a lot of people. We we all know a lot of people. But out of all the people, who has really been the most successful? Who really has got this whole life and business thing down? Who do I admire? And I came up with a list of 20, 25 people. Um, one of them is a, a, a business a business coach up in, in Santa Cruz. I've known him for years. I, knew, I met him in college. I met his wife before they even met each other. And we go way back, uh, just remarkably, uh, remarkably successful, lives, lives, surfs every day, lives right by the ocean. In fact, his daughter just came into my office this morning. We just have this, this great uh, friendship. And he's just the kind of guy that once in a while when I'm in crazy L.A. traffic, I'll call and just see how he's doing or he'll call and mm-hmm, see how I'm mm-hmm. doing. And it's just these people that, that share ideas, you can tell them what's on your mind. They'll give you honest feedback. They're not yes men. They tell you the way it really is. And you know that the advice that they're, they're giving you is really smart because they're, you know, really successful. Um, and, and having a group of people like that is, is really essential to, to nurture. Yeah, no, I agree. And, one guy, I was trying to remember how he referred to it. I think he talked about developing a bench, like using a sports analogy, right? That you need to have a deep bench, uh, which uh, it was analogous to your success circle. I think it was a, a good visual way of thinking about it too. So some yeah. of the some of the we habits that we talk about in the book is are surprisingly just really basic human things that that uh, you know in any profession, but certainly in sales, are are really important. And and I talk about it in in some of the work that I do. And one is, you know, be kind. Now we think, okay, we were all taught that at a very young age, but but it's really being kind, but being mindful of being kind is the way you really express it. Talking about how just even, a, you know, small changes in the tone of your voice can have a huge impact on the people you're trying to build a relationship with. Yeah, absolutely true. I have a rock in my uh, house, and it's probably the single most important word, and it's kindness, um, which is really another way of just saying empathy. Being being kind means that you understand that other people are fighting their own battles; they got their issues, mm-hmm. and and just being empathetic and understanding uh, goes a long, long way in terms of building key relationships. Um, so, in the in the we cornerstone. It's very simple stuff. And in fact, on Amazon, I have five stars, but I got a couple people that really uh, don't like the book. One of them says it's just too basic, too simple. And, and I love guys like that. And I want to say thank you to the people like that, because pe- that kind of thinking is what creates so many disasters around the world that, that keeps me so busy. But, <laughs> you know, quite honestly, it is simple stuff. Like one of the statistics we came up with is simply waving at people. If you, I have... I have two homes. I have one in Laguna Beach, and I have one in an area called Coto de Casa, which is embarrassing sure. to admit, but mission, mission it's where they home. film uh, the real house of the OC. And uh, it, it's funny because in the neighborhood in Laguna Beach, all the neighbors, every, all the kids, everybody waves at each other. You're walking, driving down the street, doesn't matter who you are, everybody waves. Everybody's friendly. I go up to Coto, and it's just, it's just obnoxious, quite honestly. And everybody goes in their garage and hides, and there's gates everywhere, and double gates, and, and very superficial uh you know, kind of mm-hmm. mindset up there. And I just thought, you know what? I'm going to start waving everybody in my neighborhood. And and I did. And everybody looked at me like I had an arm growing out of my head. I was just some kind of freak. And, you know, and but I just kept doing it. And now I go through my, uh, you know, the little part of my neighborhood and people wave. Um, it's kind of changed the dynamic. And, and it's kind of funny to see the transition. But at first, everybody is very uncomfortable about what this freak was doing by just saying hello and waving to everybody. <laughs> well, I, 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 I've done something very similar. So, yeah, I go out and run, and I like go out and run, and and yeah, when I'm running in California, is you know everybody you pass somebody, everybody says hi, you know, hey, how you doing? Yeah. So a little head nod or something. So when I'm here in my home in Manhattan, and I'm out running along the East River and Central Park, yeah, if you say hi to somebody, they're like. Uh, what? <laughs> or yeah. you know, let me run the other direction as fast as I can. You know, who are you? What sort of <laughs> creep are you? 
And uh, yeah, I'm sort of bound to determine to keep doing it just until I get somebody to respond. Now, another yeah. another habit you had that I thought was was interesting was the uh, social exchange theory. So, important six to one ratio. So, explain that because I, I never read across that before. Well, basically, when you say something negative or complain to someone, it, it, it it's like a bank account, and you you made a withdrawal, and that's okay. Once in a while, you gotta you know see what's on your mind, and it may not be entirely positive. But when you do that, you need to be conscientious that there's a six to one ratio. So if you say something negative or you have to, you know, set someone straight as as a uh, business leader, you want to conscientiously do six things that are positive to kind of offset it. Because of all the things that you're saying are negative, you know, you're, you're going to repel, you know, good people from the organization. So it's, it's basically saying, okay, you know, I'll, I'll kid around with my wife. She'll say something about, you know, you forgot to take out the trash cans. You're being lazy. And I'll say, okay, well, you said something negative. Now you got to say six things that are positive. Is there some science behind this? I mean, research? Yeah, th- yeah, there is actually a number of studies. You know, some of them say six to one, some say eight to one. It, it depends. I, that, I think the most middle middle of the road approach uh, is what I have in the book is six to one. But yeah, there's a lot of social research saying that that basically you've got to balance out with this some kind of ratio, the positive to the negative, to make sure that. Um, you're you're making more deposits than you are making withdrawals in terms of your your social capital and your your relationships. Well, I think one of the real powerful ways to look at that, at least the one that struck me, is that it talks really about the power of if you're in sales of making a bad first impression and how hard it is to recover. Right? Because if if to use your your phrase, you have to generate six smiles for every frown. Um, yeah, if you create a bad first impression, you're not prepared, you're, you, know, you haven't done your research on the customer, you sort of stumble through asking questions, or you can't explain clearly what you do, there's a reason why it's really hard to recover from that. Yeah, you, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not yeah. just a one-for-one one exchange, it's a, it's a six-to-one exchange. You, know, you have to do B, <laughs> bring your A++ game in order to, to make up. Yeah, absolutely true. And like the old saying goes, there's, you only have one chance to make a good first impression. You know, what, I, what, what I've what i done and I've seen done when that happens, and it does happen, let's face it, is just to be honest and, and you know, call a person up and say, you know what, I think I made a bad impression and I take responsibility. I apologize to you because I didn't have this or I didn't have that. And uh, but I, I would like to, you know, do this to, to uh, you know, make up for it. Just being honest because they already know the truth. It just the fact that you acknowledge the truth that that you messed up. I think people respect that, and and a lot, you know, uh, everyone tri- trips and stumbles, and I think people respect those that kind of admit it, and then um, you know, make a more conscientious effort the second time. I think there are ways to recover from that successfully, but you're right. That first impression is critically important. Well, what you're talking about is another one of the the we habits, which is really humility. And this is one that seems to be in short supply oftentimes today uh, in many in many sectors of our public life and private life. But yeah, humility is is well, it's one of the ways that that you actually make yourself attractive to uh, not necessarily in a romantic sense, but when you're dealing with a prospect, you're in sales, a little humility goes a long way. Well, and yeah. It has to be authentic, you know, you can't be faking it and so on, but but being humble. You know, people yeah. get it. People gravitate to you. Well, it's in- interesting you say that, Andy, because a lot of salespeople are type A personalities. They're very outgoing. They have a lot to say. They're dynamic. And they can you know, they can kind of bulldoze over a lot of people with that kind of personality. It, it's fine to have a type A personality, but you know, humility is essential. Uh, one of the lives I, I, I like to study great lives like Lincoln and Einstein and John Wooden. Uh, you know, I went to UCLA and really admired him. Mm-hmm. But uh, one of the lies I've been studying lately is Leo Fender, the guy that invented the Fender guitar. He was in, in, in remarkably humble. Mm-hmm. Uh, when he sold his first company, he got about $300 million in today's dollars. And he, at the time, he was living in a mobile home, and he just stayed there. Uh, he, he liked it, the efficiency. He never tried to show off or impress anyone. And the, the, he could do the job and step in to do the job of any one of his 1,000-plus employees he went home with uh, grease under his fingernails like anyone else, and if a machine broke, he was the first one on the on the concrete floor climbing under it to fix it. So, I mean, it wasn't so much humility; it was just it was just, hey, 
uh, no jobs uh, beneath me. And if there's something that needs to be done, you know, I'm going to get it done. Um, and everyone saw that, including my dad, who, who worked there. As, my dad was head of research and development and really got behind this and uh, this guy and re- rooted for him because he was so likable and, and so nice to people. There was another story. <clears throat> He's walking through the plant. A new guy had been hired. And uh, the guy wasn't quite doing the job right. And he went up to him and says, you know, can I make some suggestions? Started showing him some stuff. And the guy said, look, buddy, you do your job and I'll do mine. (laughs) And Leo, Leo showed what he was all about. He just smiled and said, "Okay," and walked on. You know, he he didn't have to say, who do you think you're talking to on the boss? He he knew he knew that everyone standing around would let the guy know for him, you know, who he was. But he said such a cool, easygoing you know, I'm not a show off. I'm not a pig. I'm not like a lot of the CEOs are today that they're just all about greed uh, and materialism that he built an enormous empire and became an icon around the world because of that cool attitude. Very cool. Well, Randall, that's a great story to end on. Or actually, unfortunately, we're out of time. But uh, tell folks how they can find out more about you, pick up your copy of your book and uh, perhaps connect with you. Well, thanks, Andy. Yeah, I'm a uh, drbell.com is um, easy to find the book me we do be it's on amazon it's in all the bookstores it's everywhere it's doing great um if you can't afford the book i would say uh send me an email and i'll send one to your library and tell them to check it out to you first but you know i can't tell you how many people have read the book and said i i need to read this once a year and i got a copy for every one of my kids it's it's uh it's just good solid foundational stuff we need to remind ourselves every once in a while all right great Well, again, thanks for joining me on the show. And friends, thank you for spending this time with us today. Make sure you come back. Join us again tomorrow. Another excellent episode of Accelerate on Tap. Till then, if you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast. Leave a review. We want to hear what we can do to make this a better experience for you. So thanks again for joining me. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. 